Thank you. I also want to thank Mushira, who just got up and walked someplace, but I think she can hear me. Mushira. Hope I did. I'm here. And I appreciate the praise, but what you should know is what you brought to the Wilson Center was so excellent, and it helps frame a few comments that I want to make. And finally, thanks too to another friend who was on the first panel, um, uh, Margot Wallstrom, who uh, was uh, part of something we did at the Wilson Center about women in leadership. And she was then at the UN, and she said, I have to go back uh, to Sweden because I have been away from my family for years, and I'm just going to put in my time as a support system for my family. And the next thing that happened, she was foreign minister. So you can't keep us down. That's part of my point. Uh, so what lessons can I offer that haven't been offered about five times this morning? I just, I just would, would make a few key points, at least that, that seem to me to be the essence of, of, of uh, my uh, career and my journey so far. Uh, first, and this was mentioned in the last panel, you have to be confident. How do women learn confidence? This is hard because as Mushira was talking about and others, some of us in our family situations or our uh, uh, societies or our religion are, are told that women are support systems, they're not leaders. Well, um, unlearn that. Uh, we're a majority of the talent, of the, of the population, so that makes us a majority of the talent pool. And you need to be confident. And I learned my confidence at a college I went to called Smith College, which is well known around the world, which is a women's college, a storied women's college in Massachusetts. And I think that is the key to the things that I have been able to do as a leader. The second uh, lesson for me is don't be afraid to fail. Don't select out just because you might not make it. Mushira has talked about failure, not that it was her fault, uh, but I failed. I ran for governor of California, the only woman in a primary, and I lost. Uh, I was very qualified to be the chair of the Intelligence Committee in the House of Representatives. I would have been the first woman to chair it and I didn't get it. But on the other hand, there were so many things that I did get, and I think that failing made me stronger. Uh, being able to keep smiling and keep going through failure makes you stronger and a better leader, uh, by the way. Don't play victim. There are plenty of reasons why there's misogyny out there and there are males who are uh, uh, hostile and there are, again, societies that are hostile. But if you uh, are confident that you have the skills, uh, if you are not afraid to fail, just keep moving. And while you're doing it, be excellent. Be the best you can be at the role you are playing. And the next role will come because you're excellent. Not because you're a woman, but because you're excellent. And that matters. And that means you have to work very hard. Uh, and especially if you have a family, I'll get to that in a minute, it means you have to give up sleep. That's my, my, my mantra in life has been sleep is optional. Something has to go, so it's sleep. Uh, next point, I only have a few more. Be brave. Be brave. Embrace new fields. That was talked about. Uh, be transformative. In my case, uh, when I was elected to Congress, I represented the aerospace uh, part of California where all of our intelligence satellites are made. That's a very... Uh, uh, <laughs> a uh, specialized field, and most people have triple PhDs, and I had a law degree. So what did I do? I learned all about it. And in Congress, I served on the Armed Services Committee, and then the Intelligence Committee, and then the Homeland Security Committee, and now I actually really know something about uh, Homeland Security and defense and foreign policy. So I learned it, uh, and I was brave to learn it, one of the first women. Two more points. One, be a mentor. Uh, you really have to do this. Everyone has been saying this. Uh, but you have to look out for the women and the men who are following you. Because if, the, if a man is following a woman in leadership, just trust me, in many cases that man will understand the skills that women bring. And Madeleine Albright always tells a wonderful story about one of her grandkids asking her, uh, Grandma, can a man be Secretary of State? Because she, she was in a history of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Condi Rice, Madeline, and Hillary Clinton. And I thought that that's an adorable story, and I love it because it's true. And my final point is have a life. Uh, a lot of women my vintage thought they had to choose between a career and a life. And a lot of them at my age, uh, 150, uh, look back and have no families and have no uh, partners and, and have no uh, uh, 
support systems that really you could you know once their parents have died and and uh, so forth that 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 are following them as as part of their family and i it's a choice you can make that choice if you if you want to but you don't have to make that choice i am uh, i have four children i have and four stepchildren and eight perfect grandchildren and that huge family powers me and uh, I next that that huge family is going to be part of it so uh, leading a think tank was a very special decade in my life i was the first woman uh, to head the wilson center we are a majority female institution, and people like Mushira give me so much hope for the future and so much pride that uh, uh, as, a, as a sisterhood, uh, we can do uh, whatever we choose. And to Jim McGann, as you know, you have this majority female support system. And, uh, you know, if you want to get the job done right, you got to put a female in charge. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Ms. Harmon. Those are fantastic ending words. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Tran. We'd love to hear your insights. Good afternoon and good evening from Hanoi, Vietnam. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you just it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my great honor to meet you virtually and to speak to you today. I would like to dedicate a special thanks to Dr. Z. Morgan for the kind invitation. I learned a lot from the previous speakers, from my own experiences. I would like to add some points as follows. First, as we know, the one is evolving rapidly with complicated developments almost every day, such as trade war, COVID-19 pandemic, digital innovation, and so on. Effective policy advice requires more than just connection with the policy makers and luck. The think tanks can't just think. They have to adapt and learn continuously as well. As women and as leaders of think tanks, I think we have to try harder than we would otherwise. In my case, I never stopped learning from my peer, from my works aside my my minister and from the works that we pioneer and i can do so with passion uh, we believe everything you do you should do with passion uh, for good policy advice such person even more important in my opinion the policy makers may know your institute for decades the policy makers may know you for years already and your passion may motivate them to add special consideration to your policy recommendations. Second, as policy advisor, I think we must be prepared to take a step back at times and when needed. We should always remember that we bring the policy option to the policy makers and we have to ensure the broadest sense and the best quality of such opinions. We have faith in ourselves. We have to progress in this career, but we should avoid being conservative. As leaders of the think tanks, you know you have to stay in front, but staying in front is not an excuse for poor perspectives. There is a saying, take a step back to see the bigger picture. It always worked in my case. When I doubt about the policy recommendations, I always go back and check if, the, if I have missed anything or if something can be improved. I'd rather ask myself such questions rather than, rather than being asked by the policy makers later. And I believe we need more than that courage to take a step back. We need to develop a habit for it. Yes. Finally, in my opinion, uh, we should always build a strong team. With that team, we can attain specialization, support, and diverse views. With that team, we can go further than we are on our own. I always spend time discussing with my team, not as leader and staff, but as peers. At my institute, CIM, 
we built a culture for providing comprehensive, bold, and well-grounded feedback to policies. I inherited such culture from my former bosses, and I developed that culture to the generations after mine. I do it via a friend-to-friend -friend approach, not by order. I entrust my team. If they make mistakes, I'm not afraid. Instead, I encourage them to learn from the mistakes. I'm not afraid. And uh, if uh, they can learn, and almost in the case they did it very well, that will pay off for themselves and to my institute, not to me as their boss. With that, I would like to end my speech here. Thank you all very much for giving me the uh, opportunity today. I wish you health and happiness. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Tran, so much. I, I actually turn to the panel one more time to just ask you guys kind of a final question and maybe kind of an ending remark from this closing session is, if you can give yourself one piece of advice that you wish you gave yourself early in your career, what would that be? Perhaps, Ambassador, we can start with you. Very much. Um, uh, you, uh, in, in my speech, uh, I mentioned sometimes about the passion. I think uh, this uh, words and this uh, passion is uh, very important. And I have a saying, I think it's not useful for me, but may be useful for others. Yeah. If you don't have uh, chances uh, to uh, do the job you love, so please love the job you are doing now. Yes, it's my great last one to say with you. Very Thank inspiring. You. Thank you. Ambassador, I'd love to turn to you now. You're muted. Oh, you're muted, Ambassador. Sorry, you're muted at the moment. <laughs> I okay. Yes, you there you go. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I should have self-confidence earlier on in my life. I used to get a lot of praise for different reasons when I, when I was young. But at the time in my career, I, I have to say I'm very satisfied with the achievements I have, I have done. And uh, what was really gratifying is that at the time when I was carrying only my name, I got the highest appreciation from the highest level and the lowest level in the society. It's, it's amazing uh, when you acquire the confidence of the grassroots, how much you can achieve by changing cultures and practices that lasted for years and years and years. When I was getting recognition from my prime minister and my president, and, and lay people in the street supporting me for my quest to chair UNESCO, I was not carrying any uh, position. And this really made me realize the amount of achievements I have managed to get through building partnerships with thousands and millions of people to change culture. We were able to change female genital mutilation from a socially accepted habit to a crime punishable by law. And up till now, I'm invited in different parts of the world to speak about the legal reform I conducted over five years to raise the ceiling for the rights of children to that of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And now, as the first vice chair of the African Committee, I can really see the appreciation. So I should have had self more self-confidence in myself Thank earlier in life. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and Ms. Harmon, to you. Just three very short comments, uh, because this is a wonderful morning. Uh, again, thank you, Jim. Uh, one, how similar we are. We're from all over the world. We have different accents, different experiences, different parents, different education. And yet, across the board uh, this entire morning, there is passion. That's such a good word. Uh, second point, how successful we are. 
just listen to every woman who has spoken this morning. I mean, sure there are uh, speed bumps and, and, and walls and thick men over us in some cases, um, but not in all cases. I mean, we now finally in the United States have a vice president who happens to be a woman. Many countries are ahead of us, uh, but how successful we are. Last point, uh, because I think this is something I didn't mention. Uh, life is a journey. There's not just one chapter. And all of us found our passion at some point. And I think it's extremely important to keep renewing that passion. If you're not happy doing what you're doing, do something else. Uh, but it is your journey. Your parents can't give it to you. Your husband can't buy it for you. Uh, your, your school can't automatically uh, uh, bestow a diploma that makes it happen. You have to make it happen. It comes from inside. And when you uh, understand that it's your journey and you have to make it fit you, then you can do all the things I talked about. You can be confident. You can uh, not be afraid of failure. You can be excellent. You can be brave. You can be a mentor. And you can have a life and teach those coming after you that they should live the kind of journey for them, defined by them, that you have lived. Thank you so much. And thank you all to all the panelists for your very frank and open accounts. So, Jim, I turn it out to you. Well, what an incredible, stunning program. Uh, as Jane said, uh, and what was my intent uh, when someone said, why do you have 130 women on the planning committee? Jane, you answered that question. Uh, it also incredibly and in a resounding way answers the men who have, when I've organized or were in the process of organizing a program said, I can't find any women for the panel. This program gave me an opportunity to essentially invite women and to demonstrate from beginning to end how powerful, how experienced, how exceptional the women who are working at think tanks in every region of the world are. I can also say that it demonstrates the importance of solidarity and the power of a community of institutions and individuals. That together, and in terms of what is represented in this program and the planning committee, represents and serves as a catalyst for change, a demonstrable statement about what needs to be done. And I am a huge um, devotee of Margaret Mead who said, a few committed people can change the world. And 400 people attending, 130 members of the panel committee, planning committee are more than enough to change the world. And the nature of institutions that we all are committed to. So thank you all. And I end on a personal note. You know, I do this because I have a twin sister. And from the earliest moments of my life, we traveled together and I could see the differences of how she was impacted by things that you have all articulated today. She worked in corporate America for the leading consulting firms. Some of them are here today and were referenced uh, and had to suffer under a, a, dis, um, a, a pr problems in terms of recognizing talent in women um, and the struggles that she endured. So I am both sensitive and aware to the struggles that she encountered. I am also pleased that so many of my interns, and so when I need something done, I turn to women um, who are in great numbers in terms of the internship because they are more mature than most of the males who uh, participate in the Think Tanks and Civil Societies program, but they are more confident. However, they do not, which is why I give leadership opportunities. They do not get the chance to lead and to fail and to grow in leadership positions early. And that is so important. I wanna thank all of you, the panelists, 
the planning committee members, uh, the interns who have made this possible. What an exceptional morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. I hope you all appreciate it. And most of all, in the words of Margaret Mead, a small group of committed people can change the world. That's our next charge. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.